Hi all. Good afternoon and welcome to the day three, the final day of Digital Media Conclave 2021. We conceived this concept of uh, Digital Media Conclave about a month back in the Joy, the Digital Journalist Association of India. And we thought about getting the policymakers and media professions to start a dialogue which will benefit the digital journalism world. That was a thought process with which we started this. And we had been having an amazing run over the last three days. And we have got an ensemble of great panelists and policymakers to join us for this discussion. On day one, we covered on revenue and sustainability. That was the topic. And we were joined by Shada Sharma of uh, Your Story and Anuradha Kiriya of The Better India. And we had a workshop on methods to monetize. Followed by that, we had day two, which was cover, covering the concept of tech, tech for the digital age, and metrics which matter for the digital age. And we were joined by uh, Professor Dev Rajaram and Professor Mueller from Berlin. And we had a workshop on the metrics by Ashwini Mishra from Hokalvai. Over the last two days, we had had a great reception of whatever we have been able to get onto the table for the digital world. And today, it is no less. We have two panelists, panel discussions and one workshop lined up for you guys. And starting the first panel, I would like to introduce my co-convener and fellow Honorary Secretary of DJOY, Deepthi, to take over and go ahead with the panel discussion, first panel discussion for today on air. Deepi, over to you, please. Thank you, Vinod. And welcome to everybody who's joining us this afternoon for our final installment of our three-day digital media conclave. It has been a joy and a pleasure to be able to put this conclave together along with my co-conveners, Vinod and Prem Shankar, and um, under the guidance of the Digital Journalists Association of India. If you're just tuning in on the Saturday afternoon, go ahead, use the chat window and tell us where you're joining us from. And tell us if you have any questions for our panelists in this upcoming panel, which I'm going to introduce in just a moment. Now, when we were discussing about this digital media conclave as the organizing group, it did not take us very long to come to this topic about artificial intelligence, tackling misinformation, disinformation, the broad umbrella of fake news, and of course, how that would matter as you know an end user and how that would influence audience engagement. And so when we were talking about putting this panel together, we thought, okay, we need to look at some subject matter experts who would be able to talk about the subject of artificial intelligence, but also the fact-checking aspect of it in the newsrooms. And who better than to pick two of the leading names right now in our industry here in India? I've got um, two wonderful individuals joining us, and I'm going to introduce Jaskira, or JK for short, who is the lead fact checker at Logically, which is an AI-driven company that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning with fact-checking teams to combat disinformation and retain the right of passage for authentic, verified news. Now, JK uh, formerly worked with the Quint, and he's also worked on many different roles through his career in the media space as a photographer, reporter, field producer, social media manager, news editor and a content strategist so welcome jk we also have gen z jacob a managing editor of boom and he works closely with social media platforms like facebook and google to help build projects to combat disinformation by the way boom was india's first journalist driven fact checking website so welcome to the both of you this afternoon thank you for taking time out to be part of this conversation on artificial intelligence Misinformation, disinformation, and audience engagement. Thank you, Deepthi. All right. So I think it's only fair to start our conversation off by uh, setting the tone of where we currently are when we talk about the challenges and the issues that are prevalent, not just in the newsroom, but as a country as a whole. So misinformation and disinformation checks right they've been around in newsrooms or rather they've been an extension of the way news reporting has been done over the years i'm a former journalist myself and when i went to journalism school one of the processes that we had to follow was ensure that you checked your facts you verified the information and then your content was reviewed by the team and finally published 
And then we've had the advent of social media. Now, social media was a platform that was really designed to be social. And somehow then there was this little intermix that happened where news and social media kind of collided. And we've seen, you know, a, a lot of news stations and news publications using social media to disseminate news and definitely tap their target audiences. Now, the question that I really have is, in your opinion, Jesse and Gen C, is it technology or newsroom processes that can actually uh, influence how really sorry to interject. Sorry. Uh, yes, Diti, uh, we have been joined by uh, uh, Sri uh, N.K. Prem Chandranji. Uh, sure. and, uh, he is the chief guest for the policy maker and the chief guest for today's event. I'm sorry to bud in. Uh, we would That's like to right. get uh, pr pr Prime Point Sinivas and Sir to give a small introduction about our uh, MP and then we will get going with this thing. Over uh, to you, uh, uh, Sinivas and Sir. Sir, good evening, Sir. Uh, Mr. Prema Chandran, in spite of, I know that uh, 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 you are busy with so many things and even uh, your family members are uh, not uh, feeling well, you are uh, in the hospital. Still, in spite of that, on our request, in a, uh, you are able to join us, sir. In fact, we are very happy that you have joined and we wish uh, your family members get a speedy recovery. And uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to introduce Mr. N.K. Premachandran. He is a fourth time MP and one of the outstanding parliamentarians. And he is a Sansad Ratna awardee and he is presently is one of the jury committee members of Sansad Ratna Awards. And uh, formerly, he was a uh, irrigation minister at Kerala government. When he was the Kerala government minister, he has received the award also for his best minister award. Wherever he goes, he shows his excellence. Wherever, whichever job that he takes up, whether as a, a MLA or a minister or a MP or whichever job that he undertakes, he always shows his excellence. Sir, welcome you, sir. We are greatly honored to have you here with us. This Digital Journalist Association of India was started five years back in 2016 by a group of journalists and uh, as a founder and chairman, I welcome you because the concept is that we wanted to bring an awareness about the digital laws, the digital regulation, digital ethics amongst the people. Where for the past two days, we are running a national conclave and we have international speakers also. We had joined and today you have joined us in the concluding day. And over to Mr. Premachandran, we would like to hear from you, sir, and uh, uh, your views on it. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. Mr. Premachandran, over to Premachandran. Thank you very much, Sri Srinivasan and uh, other distinguished guests, and also the office bearers of Digital Journalists Association of India and my dear friends who have joined in this conclave. First of all, I take this opportunity to congratulate Prime Point Foundation for having such an association, Digital Journalist Association of India, one of the five initiatives of five Prime, Prime Point Foundation. And also I have learned that you have already formed another association by name Digital Security Association of India is also. So when the digital world, or when the world is moving in the digital direction, the day-to-day -day life and everything is being digitalized. Definitely, this matter has to be well brought into the public domain and to have and to create an awareness, awareness about it and the way by which it is being used, the misuse of the media and the best way by which it can be used for the public at large and what are the means and ways by which this can be controlled to an extent. All these things will come in the digital media conclave, I think. See, second point of my congratulation is for holding such a digital media conclave for two days and in which uh, participating in more active involvement of the policymakers, media owners and media professionals and other people who are interested in this area are being included in this conclave and the different or the divergent views of the different personalities have been brought into the common platform by which we can create an awareness, not only creating an awareness, to find out or trace out some solutions which are being faced by the digital media at this juncture. 
So once again, I take this opportunity to congratulate Mr. Srinivasan. I know the Prime Point Foundation, which has constituted the Sansat Rekna Award for having better performance in Parliament. And he is having an evaluation of the parliamentary work which is being going on in our country. And also in the digital media also now, you, for the last five years, we are working in the digital media in the name of Digital Journalists Association of India. And on the auspicious of Digital Journalists Association of Hi, I think there seems to be a technical problem from uh, Prem Chandran sir's side. Uh, we are just in touch with him to get him on board back. Just give us a minute. Hello. Sorry, Hello. sir. I think. Yes, sir. Sorry, I think there was a problem with the uh, audio. I think we are back on track. Thank you. Yeah, okay, yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is, I am. I am in Delhi. You know the poor yeah. connectivity in in India. The more, poorest connectivity in India is in Delhi, especially regarding MTNL and BSNL. That is the problem which we are facing. Anyway, I think I think now it is clear. Yes, sir. We are we are able to hear you, Logan, sir. Thank you, sir. So, so, so I, uh, so I have gone through the agendas of two days conclave and uh, these very pertinent subjects and very significant issues which we have discussed. That is the impact of media, its credibility, and the rules and regulations for digital media, and uh, digital media's uh, the use and how it could be the the freedom of speech and expression. All the almost all the issues you have covered. So it is an undisputed fact. Or and it is an accepted fact, democracy, media is the fourth pillar of our democracy. And uh, the traditional media which we have been followed for uh, since long. Now this, even the traditional media is being replaced by this digital media. Because digital media connects people in ways which never before possible. We have never even thought of such a situation by which we can have this connectivity. With the people, who are wherever he may be, but whether the time is not a problem and the distance is not a problem. So we have never imagined of such a situation of connectivity through the digital media. To build a friendship across time and distance, socially isolated people can also come into the mainstream. And in short, we can very well say that this digital media makes feel more connected and more informed. Digital media gives people a voice, increase civic participation, and facilitate the creation of communities. Traditional media on several occasions nowadays, it is being replaced in several areas. So digital media amplify the response to the humanitarian issues and support to these issues. If you examine during the last decade, if you examine, if you verify, we can very well see that so many pertinent issues, humanitarian issues, have brought into the limelight only because of the digital media intervention. During the Arab Spring of 2011, there is a digital media served as a vehicle to mobilize the resources for the Arab Spring. 
So inf- the second point which I would like to make is the information sharing. See, the information sharing is a greater access to the facts, figures, and statistics. Everything is very simple and it has become very easy. So to build up communities, organize action, and Multitude of issues. All these things was to show that the significance of digital media in the public life has become inevitable. And in India, if you examine the history of digital media in India, it has started, I think, in the year 1995 during the Independence Day, August 15, by the Videsh Sanchar Nikam Limited (VSNL), and subsequently a revolution has took place in India regarding the digital revolution or the digital media involvement. See, first point I, I would like to touch upon is regarding the value of digital media in the market. It is being estimated, so many studies have, so many series of studies were conducted and it is being estimated that 2020, the value of digital media in India is 235 billion Indian rupees. By 2023, it is estimated, the projected estimate is 424 billion Indian rupees. That is the participation or the, the value of the digital media in the market. That is, digital media is industry's growth in India is surprising. It has never even thought of. Such a growth is there. So the digital media industry's growth in India is unimaginable growth is being taken place. That is why IIT is being projected as 424 billion Indian rupees. That is the market share by 2023 means that we can we can very well see or imagine the exponential growth of digital media in our country. And that has been enhanced after COVID-19 or during the time of COVID-19 also. The studies will goes to show that after the effect of uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, global pandemic, media and entertainment industry has suffered a lot. But at the same time, the digital media, there is, it is being marked as a big growth in digital media, especially in TV, gaming, digital and OTT platforms, are seen concept, big growth is being recorded. So definitely at this juncture, regulation of digital media is the need of the hour because such a big market and such a big exponential growth of the digital media in the country even the traditional media is being replaced by this digital media in such a situation definitely it is affecting even the day-to-day life information sharing and bringing out so many causes and even organizing communities in almost all aspects of life, digital media is placing, probably playing a vital role in the digital media in such a situation. Definitely, regulation of the digital media is also required as per the system to run. Regulation under the Information Technology Act. See, there is a code of ethics is. There is a code of ethics is incorporated in the Information Technology Act. The code of ethics is in conformity with the restrictions on freedom of speech and expression under Article 19.1a of the Constitution. See, we all know that 19.1a of the Constitution is giving the fundamental right to the freedom of speech and expression. Freedom of the press though it is not specifically mentioned in Article 19.1a of the Constitution, it is implied within the freedom of speech and expression. That is, freedom of media is also embodied in Article 19.1a of the Constitution. So reasonable restrictions can be imposed on the freedom of speech and expression in protecting the sovereignty and integrity of our country and to counter the terrorism and so many and to avoid or restrict the anti-national activities and so many grounds have already been stated in 1901. So reasonable restrictions can be imposed on the freedom of speech and expression. So now we have to look into the restrictions or the regulations of digital media and its practical difficulties. See, on August 14, the Bombay High Court 
states some provisions of the information technology rules 2021 which regulate intermediaries that is the social media communication platforms search engines telecom or network service providers so the high court the bombay high court has stated some rules in restricting the rights or the freedom of this intermediaries and the code of ethics at the same time the code of ethics prescribed under these it rules appears to be unconstitutional to that is to restrict the freedom of right of freedom of right of speech and expression this is the observation of the bombay high court so the court what the court says the court of ethics incorporated in the act says that just like that of the press council of india so many media persons are also participating in the debate i think that they can authentically uh, put on these issues because there is press council of india under the press council of india act of 1978 is there so the digital media has to comply strictly comply with the provisions of press council of india act of 1978 or they have to comply with the directions and guidelines enunciated by the press council of india that is the first one and the second one is as far as the programs are concerned as far as the program code is concerned it is being prescribed that they should comply the digital media should comply the cable tv network regulation act of 1995 so the press council act of 1978 and the cable tv network regulation of 1995 all the provisions in these two acts have to be strictly complied in respect of the news in respect of the information or in respect of the programs these two enactments are alien to the information technology act 2000 by imposing these obligations and a mandatory code of ethics finally the observation is that will result in the freedom of flow of information in the internet that will be the resulting effect of it because this is an internet media free flow of information free flow of internet service is required so as to have the spreading of this news and information and the programs for i can very well cite an example the publishers of digital media are required to exercise due caution and discretion before transmitting any content which may deemed as anti-national or inciting disorder in the society. So this is a Press Council of India Act observation. Sorry, Press Council of India Act provision is there. Cable TV Network Act also such a provision is there. That is, you have to have the due caution and discretion before transmitting any content which may deemed as anti-national or inciting disorder in the society. So regulatory censorship, this is the regulatory censorship of online media. This is always a debate and now also it's a debate and so many attempts are being coming from the government of India and the data protection bill is being agitated, well agitated in parliament. Now Sri, the data protection bill which has gone to the standing committee and the standing committee has submitted the report day before yesterday. The parliament is also going to discuss on the data protection bill, which is also part and parcel of restricting the right and freedom of the digital media. So definitely what my point is, yes, the freedom of speech and expression is there. So you cannot restrict the freedom of the internet media or the digital media. Why? Because of because spontaneous flow of information and news is the unique character of digital media or digital programs. Otherwise, nothing is there. So they are, whether they will get a chance to scrutinize, especially the intermediaries, whether the service providers will be able to check all the contents of these things and see whether it is anti-national or it is creating any disorder in the public society, then only the contents of that media, so contents of that subject will be transmitted means it is practically not possible. This is the practical difficulty which we are facing. So in such a situation, definitely absolute freedom, absolute freedom without having any restrictions will never hold any good. That is our world experience. If you examine wherever it may be, absolute freedom in the sense there is no restrictions. 
there is no guidelines there is no directions nothing is there then it will be of no good that is our experience even our own experience in india so i feel that reasonable restrictions may be imposed in order to regulate the digital media that is need of the hour otherwise we all know that it is creating when we talk about the digital media marketing their contribution everything when we appreciate at the same time the disastrous things which are being done using the digital media also has to be taken into account when we compare these two things the disastrous things which the digital media is doing in one side and very positive good sense of so many things which i have already made that the creation of the communities building up a friendship and fraternity among the people throughout the globe and so on, and sharing of information when all these positive aspects are there the negative aspects of the digital media has also to be taken into account how to have how to control it how to regulate it my only point is we should have a check and balance that never means restricting the freedom restricting the freedom of the media internet media but should have some control should have some regulations not like that of the press council of india and the cable tv network act but uh, other than that in spite of that some regulatory mechanism has to be there so as to check whether the contents or whether the things are being published with a malafide intent intention to destabilize the unity and integrity of our country and to create disorder in the society or to harass anybody or with a malafide intent intention that has to be checked there yes, i do accept that cyber crimes are there offenses are there and courts are there ipc provisions are there but at the same time a separate enactment for which is highly essential that shall not be for restricting the freedom but to regulate the freedom regulating the freedom of the digital media is highly essential highly required i think that you most of the eminent personalities in the panelist may have their own independent opinion in this issue i am as a common man especially a people's representative representing the common mass of our country i am making my personal observation not on the basis of any authenticated study on this issue these are my observation which i would like to make at the concluding session of this two day conclave of the social sorry on this uh, digital media organized by the digital journalists association of india which comes under the umbrella organization of five point foundation of india with these words i conclude once again i i wish this thing uh, with this this uh, conclave digital media conclave all the best and let your earnest efforts to intervene in the public issues especially this is one of the very serious significant issue to be discussed at this juncture some legislation is required stringent legislation means stringent legislation to regulate not to restrict once again i repeat not to restrict the freedom of speech and expression not to restrict the flow of information not to restrict any of the fundamental rights of the citizens of our country but regulation is required with these words once again i express my sincere thanks to the organizers and also i extend my congratulations to all who are behind this uh, uh, digital media conclave with these words i conclude and express my sincere thanks for affording me this opportunity to just express my view as a policy maker law maker and thank you very much what an excellent oration sir like your speech in parliament this is a sample probably everybody recently we also published his parliamentary speeches in the ebook format every speech of his will be like this in the parliament with the data and with analysis what a wonderful speech sir it is a new eye opener in fact i after you were hearing your speech we will also ask our uh, delhi people uh, like vinod priya and all to meet you and discuss with you some of the core issues that are uh, 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 that the common man is facing it so that you can as a policy maker you can also take up the matters with the parliament so thank you very much sir i know that uh, with a difficult time and uh, you are able to spare a lot of your time with us and thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you welcome welcome thank you very much thank you very much thank you uh, 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 thank you. you can proceed with you yeah. can proceed with the panel discussion yeah.
uh thanks sir i think uh, the points made were very well well taken you talked about the uh, uh the fantastic growth with digital journalism has been enjoying at uh, 24% i think this is the biggest growing segment in the media and entertainment space and yes i think uh, we have achieved what we ended up uh, starting to start a dialogue between policy makers and media professionals to essentially look at what are the things are and then evolve this i i'm sure that digital media has reached inflection point from here we can grow leaps and bounds and how to control that and take it in a nice way i think you have very successfully put that particular point and uh, over to deepthi for resuming the point and i think it is in line with what uh, shri premachandran ji has just mentioned uh, we are uh, talking on how ai is going to evolve and how this is going to impact digital journalism and uh, this is in line with the kind of growth which is being happening in digital journalism and over to deepthi please uh, let's uh, uh, get back into the uh, panel discussion and uh, over to you thank you vinod and thank you sir for taking the time to speak to our um, online audiences as well as to the team that's connecting today we appreciate your time we know that you've had a lot going on so thank you again for joining us this afternoon do stay stay safe thank you very thank you absolutely <clears throat> all right so good afternoon everyone and uh, we're sorry for the technical glitches it just goes to show that as much as technology is advancing there are always going to be issues that surround technology which is why we need to be more patient and uh, we thank you again for joining us this afternoon so we are actually going to be talking a little bit of today about artificial intelligence misinformation and audience engagement and on our panel i'm just going to very quickly reintroduce our two panelists in the interest of time we've got jaskaril baba or jk for short who's a founding member of the quint and he started webcoof and is right now working with logically heading their fact checking team in india logically is a uh, an ai driven machine learning uh, company that helps fact checkers around the country really do their jobs much better with the aid of technology and we also have gen z jacob who is the editor at boom he works with facebook and google on several different projects to help combat misinformation and disinformation so thank you gen z and jk for joining us in this uh what is going to be a next 45 minutes of interesting conversation and hopefully our audiences joining us from around the world will find information that is helpful for them in their field of work okay so before we left off we were really getting into the conversation about how misinformation and disinformation have been elements of how journalists have learned over time um to consider and to review their work and so there are many stages within a newsroom in how one looks at your content you look at your article you cross check your facts you corroborate the information and only then is it really put out and then we've had social media that has come around and how individuals or, or sort of rather newsrooms have put their information out on these social media platforms so gen z and jk in your opinion is it technology or newsroom processes that influences how we finally see the story online and where can we resume the conversation of fact checking today hi uh, dipti i'm glad you asked the question uh, you know i've been a mainstream media journalist before i uh, uh, i came to boom uh, in 2016 and uh, you know to answer your question uh, you need both you need both technology and processes as well uh, see if uh, there are many people who ask me this question and many editors who have asked me this question many years back not any longer considering how misinformation has permeated into every sphere of our life uh, and the question that they always ask me is that why do you need fact checking as a separate enterprise or as a separate newsroom when fact checking is at the core of what journalism is supposed to be and my only counter to that question is that if the mainstream media newsrooms of which i i have been a very fortunate to be a part of many good newsrooms working with very good editors if they would have woken up to this danger of misinformation many years earlier uh, fact checking would have been an enterprise that or, or be, would have been something that mainstream media newsrooms would have discovered on its own and unfortunately they didn't and that's how we saw political parties forming it cells taking over social media uh, you know at least uh, Uh, 10 to 12 years uh, you know back uh, you know with elections successive elections how they completely un took understood the pulse of uh, what people are reading online 
of how uh, narratives are getting created and the mainstream media was completely unaware of this they they had not woken up to this it's only when fact checkers came onto the scene and started looking at the processes by which stories were being picked up by mainstream media outlets uh, by uh, you know digital outlets by uh, uh, by politicians you know how they were misinterpreting uh, information that is that is available publicly data that is available publicly which is being misinformed uh, when it is being shared with the public uh, members of the public it's only when fact checkers like us came and created recreated those processes that mainstream media newsrooms have now uh, started bringing it into their newsrooms i do know uh, several mainstream media newsrooms who have uh, created their own fact checking teams uh, both to work on the social media side as well as on uh, you know the regular stories that they write to add that layer of fact checking because one key part of the job that my newsroom does is to keep an eye on what news channels papers digital media newsrooms of newspapers and television channels are putting out as news and there are so many occasions i don't have data off hand with me so many occasions especially during the afghanistan crisis that they were literally picking up stuff from social media and pushing it out on air without any layer of fact checking and and it's not that editors don't uh, understand this they have understood it but speed is something that they have paid a premium to than actually quality and fact checking and that's something that has to change and only if that changes will the trust that mainstream media has lost in the minds of the readers will be returned you need a robust mainstream media to exist i have never taken the position that digital media is going to eclipse mainstream media that is not going to happen mainstream media is here to stay television channels are here to stay and they are all very important uh you know elements of what we call you know uh, you know the fourth estate and, and that's why we require uh, them to actually you know introspect to look into their own processes and use technology like how uh, all fact checkers are using use technology to understand you know whenever they get a video or an image or they get some uh, information on social media how true it is what are the layers of fact checking that needs to be added they need to do that and they have to do it as soon as possible you know you actually raise a very valid point that a lot of newsrooms in the country right now have jumped on the speed wagon it's about being first right it's not really about being factually right and it also reminds me of um, this biography that uh, was published a few years ago it was actually a movie that was based on the story of an american journalist named stephen glass and how um, he worked for a news organization and over time what happened as he was publishing these stories and articles the people that he had interviewed would say oh but this is not true this is not true this is not what i said and so credibility was really at stake for the organization as well as for the journalist and shortly afterward they found out that a lot of the work that he was doing was just fabricated uh, information and this is like way back in the late 80s and in the 90s right and now we have technology that has made that much faster the turnaround time of that is much faster and so jk my question for you is with uh, the influence of artificial intelligence with the influence of technology that's coming into newsrooms to aid the work of journalists how can we best use and how can newsrooms position themselves to better utilize the tools that are available Thank you for the question, Deepthi, and thank you for inviting me for this discussion. Uh, having been a journalist in, in in the mainstream media organizations myself, just like Gen Z has been, uh, I, I feel first step is the intent, and the intent has to come from the newsroom leadership and the media leadership that we have right now, because they are the ones who had pushed from the rigor and the checks and balances to a more speed oriented uh, news dissemination service, uh, where, like you suggested, it's about who gets it first and not about who gets it right. Uh, once the intent shifts from not getting it first, but getting it right, uh, I feel like AI is something that can be used as a means to an end uh, where getting it first and getting it right at the same time is something that could happen over time. But of course, the intent needs to be there. We have situations like Jensi pointed out about, about, about the Afghanistan uh, the in, in August when Taliban was taking over. Uh, Kabul and Afghanistan, and in so many other incidents, whether it's a natural disaster, let's say flash floods in Uttarakhand. Uh, I distinctly remember back in 2013 and 2014 when the massive flash floods happened in Uttarakhand, old visuals were being passed off as recent ones, as the latest ones by news agencies. And because the news agencies were sending those visuals, channels across the country or across the world for that matter 
We're using old out of context visuals to show or depict a particular natural disaster. And this has been happening over a period of time. And the reason we have this is because efficiency, the human efficiency is going down just by dealing with the sheer volume of information. It's an, in, it's an infodemic that is being dealt with because of the sheer volume of information that is coming in while the human element or the human filter is restricted by budgetary constraints, editorial constraints, or other constraints. And hopefully we are moving into uh, uh, towards a solution where AI can act as a way to deal with that level of volume. Uh, that is why uh, intent has to be the first factor to, to, to come into play over here. Once the intent is taken care of, we can have technology come in as an enabler, just the way technology has been an enabler in digital dissemination of news. Similarly, technology can be an enabler, allowing the human filters and the fact checkers to get the job done faster. Especially, we are dealing with the scale at which uh, a lot of the disinformation and misinformation is happening. Misinformation, which is accidental, and disinformation, which is by intent. That scale sometimes far exceeds the, the human filter or fact checking processes that exist currently. And that scale is something that we are looking uh, 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 that we believe that a lot of the uh, companies should start looking at addressing with the aid of technology. Now, as I'm listening to both of you all speak, a question that comes to my mind is actually, where does the buck stop? Because when you look at the newsrooms, they would blame, you know, the bots. If you look at uh, technologists and social media platforms, they blame, you know, different factions, whether it's politics or whether it's other individuals that have uh, intent. So where does the buck stop, Gen Z? You know, the buck stops with the, uh, uh, with the editorial teams as far as uh, in all of these news channels are concerned. See, there was a time when uh, newspapers were were deciding the agenda of news coverage. Then uh, the phase came where television channels started doing it. And today, it is sad to say that television channels think that they are the ones who are deciding the agenda, but unfortunately, they are not. It's the social media which is deciding their agenda, and then they are deciding the agenda for the rest of the media to follow. Now, that's unfortunate uh, that it is happening that way. And the buck has to stop with the editors of... Uh, these news channels and newsrooms who are uh, probably not uh, caring enough that the, the the visuals and the images and the narratives that they're putting out have not been fact-checked. There's no layer of fact-checking. There is rampant spread of, uh, of the, this kind of misinformation. And you'll never see them uh, even uh, apologizing or even issuing a regret. At best, you know, if they are forced by some court or probably, you know, their own, uh, you know, arbitrator, you know the the uh, the body that they have in the television uh, uh, association if they are and that too also in some of the recent cases that we have seen where they have you know it's 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 barely a rap on the knuckles even for these television channels they are saying oh seven months back you played something which was not right please take it down who cares whether they take it down or not they have not even been forced to apologize they have not even been asked to issue an apology or to say that you know that they have to uh, in bold uh, you know formats they have to say that they were wrong about something that they put out in the in the past this is the kind of you know uh, you scratch my back i'll scratch yours that's the kind of attitude they have so you know where the buck stops the bucks should stop uh, at the you know at the editors but i don't know i'm like you know i heard the previous panel uh, you know the mp talking about regulating the media and he said you know freedom has to be restricted i don't know whether he used those exact words but i disagree with that as well the the you know the need to regulate uh, media or misinformation and in, in the misinformation that comes from the media the answer to that is actually not to use the law to go after the media and that and we are talking about a country like india where press freedom and i'm sure Dipti, that would have been your next question but press freedom is is that is at a real low at such a time you cannot have the government deciding what is good content and what is bad content and i'm using the word content here because unfortunately news uh, you know we ourselves have brought us uh, you know to, to this stage where we are deciding uh, editorial information or what is news as content and when it is content it can be anything but the answer to that is not to restrict the freedom of the media you have to find ways to involve uh, you know uh, the mainstream media and uh, news organizations editors to come together and talk about this how can you you know self regulate yourself Pro probably bring some other disincentives you know in a way to ensure that you know that they regulate themselves but 
uh, unless that is done if you go and do a blanket law you bring in a law and says you know that you know that we will pull you off air or we'll pull you down or we won't allow your website to uh, to function in a country like india where we don't know which political party has what agenda it is some it's a recipe for disaster and that should not happen to uh, to allow democracy to function the way it is all right i'm going to uh, apologize in advance there is some drilling work happening at the apartment where i'm living so if you all are having a disturbance of the noise i do hope you could bear with me as i go into my next question which in fact gen z just happened to preview in fact uh, india has slipped when it comes to the press freedom index of reporters without borders in the last few years right it's occupying the 146th position of 180 countries how do we hold accountability in a country that already has rising issues on press freedom, but at the same time, it's pushing for a digital India. JK, would you like to take that question? It's, uh, again, this, this again should see intent from uh, the news of leadership to the leadership that we have actually got in the country, the country leadership. Of course, everybody likes to control the media. This is not about something which we are dealing with in this day and age. Uh, you go back to the emergency era, you go back to all across, when, even when we had only a state-sponsored media in the country, control over media is is something which is tempting regardless of whether you are in a, a, in a democratic country or a different nature of governance. Uh, yes, it is of a concern that press freedom in India has dipped, while at the same time we are pushing for more of a digital domain. But I do believe that digital, the digitization of news has been one of the best things that's happened to information, the flow of information, it's become the democratization of news uh, as something that, uh, again, uh, uh, Gen Z was my senior uh, in, in, in the conventional mainstream media organizations. He was a television journalist, already a television editor when I was a young reporter at that time. And he will tell you about how the editors used to decide, decide the agenda for the day and they were, they didn't have any two-way street there was there was hardly it was always in a glass chamber of sorts where they decided that this is what the nation should know about digital changed that we finally had people who had access direct access to the celebrities or rather the news personalities who had become celebrities or the editors and the newsrooms and organization and they were pushing back telling them that this is not what we want to know about we want to know about that we want to know about what matters to us on a day-to-day -day basis that democratization of news that has happened thanks to social media, thanks to the penetration of digital uh, uh, access and, and, and uh, cheaper data services. I know it's a flip side. I know, uh, and I, I, I would argue that uh, the data access has spread at a faster pace than media literacy has in this country, unfortunately. But I have to look at it as glass half full as well, where digital India has been great for democratization of news. There has been some pushback. A lot of bubbles have burst. A lot of elitism within the media coverage has also been removed uh, thanks to this pushback that is coming, all thanks to what we are referring to as digital India. So I hope that that, in the long run, that work continues in, in, in the right spirit. And this di di uh, digitization of India, the digital access that even uh, people in the far off reaches where you cannot get satellite connection, where you cannot get dish connection, or you're not even getting regular electricity connection. If they are getting access to a stream of information, yes, it is our endeavor, our effort as fact checkers of media organizations uh, to make sure that they are getting the correct information, or at least they understand to how to distinguish between incorrect and correct information. But largely, uh, while it can be argued that the press freedom is dipping because there's a serious clampdown happening on media coverage, there's retribution happening against freelance journalists. If you have seen the journalists traveling all the way from Kerala to Uttar Pradesh and then having uh, laws of very serious nature being imposed on them because they've been involved in coverage. Uh, at the same time, I think there is this counterbalance happening with the whole democratization of news as well. Gen Z, what are your thoughts when it comes to regaining accountability? Well, as far as accountability is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, uh, accountability has to start in the newsroom, right? So uh, a lot of this accountability will have to start from the editors. You know, the, the, the ground reporters actually get a lot of flack because they are the first line of defense or offense, as you call them. They are out there. Uh, you know, you see them on air. You see them uh, asking questions. Sometimes you may say, what kind of questions are television reporters asking? 
but don't ask that question ask who's their editor and why is it that the reporter has now uh, you know ask is not is not getting the freedom to ask some real tough questions and i still have a lot of friends in the television channels and uh, they they do admit privately that you know that they are really sick and tired of uh, you know this uh, of all that is happening they want to ask some really tough questions but they are not permitted to because of whatever uh, reasons but yet even in the midst of all of that you will still see some of them really emerging out going out there on the field uh, asking some really tough questions you know uh, standing in the face of uh, probably the police or those in administrate uh, administration doing some real injustice which you can see on air publicly uh, but yet they are out there so they are the ones who really need to be nurtured and 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 need to be given that encouragement so that you know that they can do their jobs they can ask the right questions but don't keep on telling them that you know that they are not doing a good job because it's not their fault and sometimes i also feel that you know uh, as as people who have been in television earlier sometimes we look back and we are too over critical of of uh, those who are continuing to be there in television and and reporting out there but accountability when it comes to accountability news channels have to take the accountability because they are the ones who are who are setting the agenda and the narrative based on some very narrow objectives these days you will not find any reporting happening any reportage happening uh, you will only find some two news stories of the day which are taken up and then blown out of proportion in i don't know dipti i don't know i don't think i have an answer for you but this accountability has to set be set in the newsroom itself otherwise you will find technology over a period of time completely taking over uh, you know some of the aspects of journalism which we think are very important today and there will be new people who will come in there will be people who will come in who who have who have who probably have not even studied journalism but they will come with new formats and 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 there there is a flip side of that there's a negative side of that and we are already seeing it today uh, in various forms of uh, people who have come with newer formats and are practicing journalism which many of us may not like but it is the result of uh, you know people who are who have spent time in this field who have the responsibility to ensure that good old fashioned journalism adopt new technologies and move forward if they are not doing it there will be new formats that will come absolutely agree with both your points i think um, largely speaking the the concept of doing traditional journalism has to go parallel to the way technology is also developing but what we're seeing here is that at some level there's been an intersection in technology when i say technology i refer to how social media is beginning to dictate what newsrooms are going to cover versus what they're not and the the disease of the season has really been sensationalism and india has long suffered by that and in fact a lot of relearning has to happen within newsrooms in order to understand that objectivity news balance and just knowing that you need to go back to the basics of journalism is really what will take you the long distance people are in it for the short term people want to see those numbers build up they want to see those reach numbers grow those uh, engagement numbers grow but really it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight and I, i think what would be a good opportunity now is just introduce one of those questions we're getting on social media uh, right now and shubhangi asks gen z that you mentioned to reinforce self regulation of media the government should introduce certain disincentives instead of laws that endanger press freedom could you elaborate on that well i didn't mean uh, disincentives uh, to be introduced by the government i just want to rephrase that uh, i didn't mean disincentives by the government but what i meant is that self regulation is something that is already uh, present in some form through the press council and through the television bodies that they have but they need to be given more teeth for example uh, as i said some some months back uh, there you know the 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 regulatory body of the television channels they came out with uh, certain rulings where they said that some ch- television channels did not do uh, you know the kind of narratives that they were putting out uh, masquerading as news was not right because they were pitch- you know pitting communities against each other but what happened after that you know there is there's nothing where you know the the channels or the editors feel okay you know let's be more careful because it's our own body which is doing this they are the ones who are telling us that this is not right and th- that is where i feel that they need to be given more teeth self regulation is the way to go ahead you cannot have the government trying to regulate the media it's a recipe for disaster look at any of the countries where democracy does not function you will find a weak media or a media which has been made 
week over a period of time by government laws that completely impede uh, them to work. But what I'm mentioning is that, you know, as far as uh, television channels are concerned or newspapers, which already have a layer of uh, self-regulation, uh, even digital uh, outfits, you know, that layer of self-regulation comes in. Uh, you have to, you know, uh, have a dialogue with them, talk to them, uh, give them that, uh, you know, that feeling that, you know, that that the government is not out there to regulate them, but to work with them in a manner in which that is self-regulate. And that self-regulation has to be adhered to by uh, by everyone who is associated with a certain body or a certain association. Uh, and and they decide that, you know, that if there is misinformation that has been put, uh, uh, you know, by their newsrooms, then they have to apologize. There are some good practices that have to be brought in. Uh, there are some good practices which do not exist in India. For example, when when the, when you get a story wrong, what we do is quietly go and remove the story. We don't put an editor's note there. When there are massive changes being made in the stories, we don't put an editor's note saying that yes, we got some parts of the information wrong earlier, uh, but we will, uh, you know, but we want to do it now. As far as boom is concerned, we do it every single time even if there's a small change that is made in the story there will be an editor's note that will go down and i do know several other websites who also do it but otherwise there are many several stories which which are which just vanish without a trace you don't know why it has been taken down was there government pressure, pressure to take them down why why do you get that 404 error you know the reader should push back they should immediately go and ask uh, on social media or they should write to the editor saying hey there was a story like this why is there a 404 error right now so that kind of pushback when the readers give, uh, uh, you know, editors and newsrooms will also start feeling responsible for it. And maybe the, there is a place for the government to work with, uh, with the media in this. I'm not saying that the government has no place to do that, but regulation is something that they cannot do because when they start stepping into regulation, then, you know, how do you uh, decide that, uh, you know, the people who are supposed to keep you in check, when you start regulating them, then who's going to keep them in check? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to just shift gears just momentarily into a little bit more on the subject of artificial intelligence and technology, right? Elon Musk said this about artificial intelligence. He said, AI doesn't have to be evil to destroy humanity. If AI has a goal and humanity just happens to come in its way, it will destroy humanity as a matter of course, without even thinking about it. Just no hard feelings. Right. So AI happens to be sort of like an answer to a lot of the troubles and a lot of the issues that are being encountered along the way as we work in the media space. But there have been several researchers that have spoken out on how AI does also get it wrong. It's not always going to be right. There's this one researcher named Janelle Shane who actually did a TED talk indicating how AI is just as good as we can make it meaning it will do what you say quite literally, but it does not necessarily have the levels of um, discretion, if you may, or deep thinking in some extents to really understand intention. So JK, the question that I have for you is, how do we work with the limitations of technology? Yes, AI does have a lot of complexities involved. We're saying it very clean. But then how do we optimize it in order for us to understand that while technology can resolve some of the issues, it's not there to replace all the issues, right? It still is on us to hold that accountability, to hold that baton and say we have to work on it. So how best can we optimize what we have with the technology that we have today? Thank you for the question, Deepthi. Uh, technology has always been an enabler. And many people try to get it wrong where they treat technology like an end, while in fact, technology was always meant to be a means to an end. And it has always been a human-driven focus or a human-driven process where technology has acted as an enabler, where we have had some matters of success. Let's just go back a century or a little over a century ago, where most of the things that we didn't even have proper roads and most of the vehicles that you saw on the roads were not motorized vehicles. And here we are where we are talking about, uh, uh, for Elon Musk, for example, his Tesla cars, which are self-driven cars or automated cars uh, in just about a century. And if you just look at the expanse of the human history, and in, in that, this one last hundred years has just been a trickle or it just been like a, a bit of a, a second, you could say, in the larger scheme of things. And in just that, we've seen technology act as an enabler of sorts. Along the way, they have been mistakes. Along the way, you had if I just take the car analogy, you've had cars which have uh, uh, ended up uh, 
killing uh, its drivers or, or or occupants or have not been very road appropriate. Uh, they didn't have safety measures in place. Seat belts and airbags came into the picture much later, about 70 or 80 years after the advent of automobile. If you take that timeline into perspective and then use the same thing in a conversation with the use of AI in information, in AI in disinformation for that matter, it's a very, very early stage. There have been mistakes where there have been racial profiling, there have been uh, misidentification of, of innocent people, all because certain uh, agencies have a, 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 a switched to an over-dependence on artificial intelligence for decision-making process. We are not there yet. And uh, especially where I am right now, uh, I, I come from a background in the traditional media setup. I have worked in the digital media setup, which has been an entirely human-driven process. And I'm looking at how some of the firms are now addressing the AI concerns or a use of AI for dealing with disinformation, for dealing with the glut of the infodemic of information. Yes, the filters are not in place because we are still at a very early stage, but it is a long run process. It is something that is to uh, primarily will remain a human driven process. It is something that will learn from human activity, uh, correct human activity for that matter. And with the correct checks and balance in place, making sure that you have a diverse set of people from different backgrounds with different sensitivities and different personas working on this and not just having a particular set of nationality or particular set of race or gender uh, mix of people working on this, then automatically the machine learning component will ensure that it is also learning from the diverse set of individuals which are working in this space. To cut a long story short, uh, we just have to do away with this notion that AI is the be all and end all answer to all our problems. It is a technological solution that will act as a means to an end in the long run, and we are just getting started. In fact, we have a question from one of our social media viewers right now who says, is AI catching up in India or is it at the forefront? I would argue it's a bit far from it because we are dealing with in India the complexity of uh, language barriers. Apart from language, you have dialects. Uh, we have technologically technological barriers as well because you are you do have a majority of the population uh, which is actually on budget phones uh, with very basic data uh, packs, even though they do have access to data, which is which is. Uh, uh, something to admire in our country uh, that we have a large percentage of a population which has access to information data. But because of the complexity of uh, uh, local level nuances, sensitivities, both political and social, and the, the language barrier and the mm -hmm. language and the dialect issue, AI is something which will take a bit longer to try and learn uh, how to catch up when it comes to the Indian context. But where there is a more homogeneous population and a homogeneous setup with, let's say, a more uniform language, we have seen how it has somewhat been useful in solution seeking. We, once again, to understand that AI is not the be all and end all, it's not an end, but it's a means to an end. We are hoping that uh, for just, if you just take example by Google Translate for that matter, just the way we are now able to point our phone screen towards even a local dialect in Southeast Asia, or let's say a, a far off part of India, and just point your phone camera towards that. In, in real time, your phone camera will translate that into a language that you understand. That is all happening over the last two or three years. And that is the direction that we're hoping to move in. Yes, again, like I said, in India, you have some unique challenges of language. You just travel a hundred kilometers out of uh, New Delhi or any other place. You will come across three different dialects and the entire geography will change. And that is something that may take a bit longer uh, to catch up on, but one hopes that just the way we have seen just basic uses, usage like translation based uh, technical solutions happening in a similar manner, we hope that AI will also catch up to the nuances and the dialects uh, uh, that we come across here in India. And just sticking to the theme of AI, uh, another question that's come in is talking a little bit about how if AI can create a reverse environment and end up creating misinformation and AI can help fight misinformation, can it also create it? So meaning AI can also get it wrong. I think the answer is pretty obvious that it can totally get it wrong. But JK, what, do you, what is your take? And Gen Z, what's your take? I, I, 
I was going to ask Jesse to step in, but if I can just touch up on this topic just a bit, I think AI, the people, the, the bad actors have already uh, got a head start on that front. They already have been using bot networks and in certain level of uh, basic level AI and technological uh, complications uh, uh, or their own solutions rather to spread this information. And the fact checkers were the ones who were playing catch up initially because we were all mostly a human driven process battling a bot network or people with resources at hand, especially when it involves state level players or players who have a lot of resources at hand, who could uh, hire companies or mercenaries for hire for that matter, uh, which you've seen even in the 2016 US elections for that, uh, for that matter, which is where the original stories came from. So I think AI has, and technology uh, wise, the bad actors already got a head start in using that for disinformation. And it is now where the serious players who are countering disinformation, who are coming around to using AI to address disinformation at scale and how it can assist the limited number of human resources that you have uh, who are doing the fact checking and how we can look at AI solving that problem for them. But over to Jensi for more on that. No, no, I completely agree with you, uh, Jessica, that, uh, you know, the, we have already seen what happened in 2016 US elections, how uh, other countries have uh, tried to meddle in uh, the democratic processes that were being done there, uh, bots you touched upon, all those topics uh, that we know uh, that, you know, it, there is some form of AI which is involved in it, though most rudimentary form of AI and not the kind of machine learning techniques that we are talking about today. And, and you know, blockchain is being talked about as far as AI is concerned and how it can be built over and, and content, uh, uh, you know, can be, uh, can be disseminated using that as well so there are several aspects of it which has been talked about right now the you know to to understand it in a more simple form uh, there is a lot of fact checking that we do uh, deepthi and uh, we fact check a lot of videos images every day and what happens is that probably after a year six months later or a year later you'll find the same images and video coming in through you know through some modification in the text which accom uh, which accompanies it and for the platforms, this is a big challenge. And this is where they are working with fact checkers like us, where, uh, you know, they are, they are teaching their machine through our stories. They're teaching their machine to identify these images and then find out the nuances with which these things are spreading. Now, it may so happen that after six months, what we have debunked today may not be spreading with misinformation. It may, it may so happen that is actually spreading with the right information, but the machine has to pick that nuance. You know, when that text, which is probably not going in English or Hindi, where a bulk of technology uh, processes are involved or a bulk of fact checkers are involved, it may be going in some dialect or some language where, uh, you know, where the machine is not able to identify. And that's why along with AI, manual fact checking is always going to exist. It will, it may not exist in the manner in which we are seeing it today, but there will be more higher and higher levels of uh, layers of fact checking that will come in and we may not be fact checking some of the images and the videos that we do it's very rudimentary stuff that you can do a reverse image search or you can use it through uh, various other tools that we do for video that basic level of fact checking may change but ai will revolutionize the way we do fact checking we pick up more complex uh, forms of uh, misinformation and disinformation so there will be many such layers that will step in uh, to answer the question it may it, it may not be happening today uh, as far as from the fact checking part, but as far as uh, from the misinformation and disinformation part, where bad actors have been utilizing this, yes, they've been utilizing it uh, since ages now. Yeah, I think uh, the, the key point there is that, you know, technology is only going to continue to grow and evolve over the years. And it's not been developed for good or for bad. It's just how actors, good or bad actors, are there to either use it for good or use it for bad. And speaking of that, the the next word that's currently doing the rounds, right, over the last three, four years has been this subject of deep fakes. And while there is a sense of, you know, trying to figure out how deep fakes would operate and how deep fakes would permeate into our, let's say, WhatsApp messages even, I think in the quest to combat uh, misinformation and fake news is also this, this path that is constantly growing and becoming more, um, I would say, intelligent in that sense. In, in terms of how deep fake technology might become more mainstream. Right now, it's still in the fringes. We don't hear so much about it, but it's being spoken about. You know, there are spaces where people are concerned that deep fake technology might land up replacing, you know, uh, 
political heads of state in, in terms of what they're saying, which makes the complexity of what y'all are doing that much more harder. So um, Gen Z and JK, with your work in this very space of combating misinformation, how would we tackle this issue in the coming years? Yes, uh, so Dipti, as far as deep fakes are concerned, uh, it's, a, it's a huge risk. And uh, it's something that, you know, many people assume that it is happening at a very deep level. I would admit that it's not really a problem today. But I'm not going to say, I'm not going to put, put my bets on it to say that you know, it's not going to be a problem six months later on uh, or probably in the next big election. Uh, we have already seen some very uh, crude examples of it. And uh, we call it cheap fakes uh, where a video is uh, very, uh, you know, very in a very rudimentary fashion. It is edited to show that the person is saying something else. Uh, so we call it cheap fakes uh, because it's not really reached up to the level of deep fakes that uh, some of the researchers have pointed out uh, through their experiments to show that how this can be used. In fact, there are some companies which, uh, you know, the last Delhi elections, they showed uh, one of the party's uh, uh, spokesperson speaking in multiple languages. Uh, there was nothing wrong about it. But yes, there is a moral and ethical question there that whether such technology should be used in election because very easily it can be misused. Uh, so that was one very good example of uh, how deep fake technology can be used and this is going to come it's not there yet here today but it will come uh, in the future as far as fact checking newsrooms are concerned we cannot say that we are completely prepared for it uh, you know i'll be fooling myself and i don't want to fool everyone by saying that yes let deep fake technology come we are going to battle it no we are not completely prepared for it there are other ways for us to figure out whether a video which has come in is it completely true or not but we cannot, we don't have a tool where we pass that video in and say, oh, but this is not an original video. This is a deep fake video. This does not mean that uh, we will not be able to counter it. There are several researchers around the world in several good universities who have got in touch with us uh, and they want to work with us. And they're constantly engaging with us to find out how they can uh, probably use several technologies to come out with a counter mechanism for it uh, so that, uh, you know, we can. Uh, find out telltale signs in those videos to know whether that video has been tampered with or whether there is something synthetic about it. And several uh, researchers, very good researchers, are working on this. Uh, I, you know, I think till the time uh, this is used in a level at which uh, the, the world around us sits up and takes notice and say, no, something has to be done about it. I don't think anyone will invest because these are very expensive technologies, even for research. Uh, Researchers to work on this, universities to work on this, uh, they need, uh, you know, deep budgets for it. And that's that's the sense that I'm getting. It's not because of lack of uh, skill or talent, but it is just uh, we haven't reached that phase yet where people feel that, yes, let's put the money in. I do feel that platforms can actually put money into it because this is something that is sitting in house. Uh, I refuse to believe that Google and Facebook and Twitter and many of these big platforms they cannot figure this out. Obviously, they have figured this out. Maybe they don't want to talk about it uh, in a manner in which uh, it brings more attention to it right now. But they will address this probably at a time when uh, you see this problem coming up on their platform. JK, what have you seen when it comes to the, the subject of deep fakes? I'll compliment uh, Vujensi's view on this, that uh, just like uh, those videos of Boston Dynamic robots, uh, which who show very combat skills and uh, Parker skills, and people get scared that, okay, oh my God, the robots are really like building up on their skill sets, and then start bringing in the question of the universal law of robots and AI. Similarly, DeepX, I'm, I'm happy to say that at least people are primed and ready and on an alert mode. In practice, we have not seen DeepX uh, being used or misused rather at a scale that we, that, let's say, was anticipated in 2018 or 2019. But it is good to see that people are on the alert mode and already activated. Just like Jensi said, there are already research groups, fact checkers who have already primed in us, sensitive or sensitized enough to uh, start looking at questionable videos for the potential of any misuse of defect technology. Uh, again, I completely agree with Jensi that the technology platforms currently have the wherewithal, have the resources and the money to actually address this problem and try and nip it in the bud. So far, we've used them, uh, we've seen them use 
uh, this uh, facial uh, 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 enhancing technology for filters on Snapchat and Instagram Reels. But I'm pretty sure they also have the existing wherewithal to go a step further and ensure that just the way you, they can use uh, their resources to create these funny re uh, uh, filters uh, on Snapchat camera or Instagram uh, camera or the Reels, they can also use the same technology to try and detect misuse uh, of defects and also to try and nip it in the bud if it ever gets shared on their platform. Definitely something to watch out for. Uh, not something that has caused any alarm yet, but it is it won't come as a surprise to see more and more misuse of this uh, defect technology happening over the next few years. I also see that um, many times AI has been used for good. I think uh, just as an example of how AI can be used for good reasons, I believe there was an ad, this Diwali, where Shah Rukh Khan had actually done a recording in one language and AI helped translate that into several other languages where you could target your audiences based on the state and the city and, you know, Shah Rukh Khan was basically saying you could go to XYZ Kirana stores and buy whatever you want to buy, which is an amazing, um, you know, feat for what AI can actually really do outside the realm of media. It can really be used for greater good. So um, as we're coming up to the end of the hour of our conversation, I just wanted to wrap up our conversation by asking both of y'all for your top two or three suggestions for our viewers who are joining us this afternoon and for many, many of those uh, who will be joining us after as well in this recorded uh, video to tell us a little bit about how one can stay digitally ahead when it comes to uh, AI and how it would influence the end user. Well, uh, uh, Dibdi, I don't know whether that question is for the larger audience or larger people or for the media, but uh, I would say that uh, don't be a fossil, uh, you know, uh, don't carry baggages of the past and say, okay, I won't allow this technology and that technology. I think we have to be tech agnostic. Uh, we have to constantly keep uh, learning and relearning and unlearning a lot of the stuff that we've already learned, which probably is not relevant today. Uh, it's it's more so true for journalists as, like us and editors who probably are constantly looking at technology change every few years. Uh, earlier, it could have been, you know, for 10, 15, 20 years, you could have been surviving on the same processes of journalism that you were using earlier, uh, while the core processes will remain same, uh, that you have to fact check everything, you have to attribute everything properly, uh, and that you know that you are not running narratives, but you're running uh, news and all narratives can be kept uh, for the op-ed pages. Uh, these are some of the old world good uh, practices that have been forgotten by many of the uh, uh, journalists today. Uh, but there are many other good journalists and editors who are also practicing that. So technology will bring lot of disruption and that disruption you have to be uh, you know you have to be awake to and you have to constantly uh, unlearn and relearn uh, you know, how that technology can make your work better and as i said don't be a fossil don't think that you know oh i have been doing this like this till now i'm not going to do it uh, any longer as fact checkers we always say this in the newsroom that what we did six months back or one year back uh, we probably have to see how we can do it better and, and, and we are constantly learning as a newsroom. And that's the only way uh, you can stay ahead by being open to new formats and by, by being open to technology that is going to disrupt your lives in every sphere. JK, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, my closing notes are uh, broadly two suggestions. One is to echo what Jesse said as, as to my colleagues and ex-colleagues in the media in both television in the mainstream media traditional media as well as the digital media is to use technology as an enabler not to think of it as a challenge to the sensitivities and also to understand that the bad actors already had a head start on you with the reuse mm -hmm. of social media and technology i mean they were already using social media for spreading disinformation before newsrooms even tried to include social media as a part of their regular news coverage uh, mechanism. There was a time when newsrooms had banned or blocked Facebook and Twitter before they actually started warming up to the idea of using it for actual dissemination of authentic information. So please definitely keep an open mind. That is mostly for the uh, uh, leadership that is working in the information dissemination space. Uh, for the public at large, it's very, very important to keep on reminding ourselves to break through the confirmation bias. No amount of AI technology, fact checker, or media organization 
can break through the confirmation bias that is already there in our mind. Do not keep on reading the same media outlet that more conforms more to your ideological and political biases. Please be open to challenging your notions and preconceived notions. Please be open to having what your idea of the perfect society is. Be constantly challenged with that. And please understand that any information that you're getting through your WhatsApp chats and through your friends and family network is getting muddled up. You cannot take anything at face value. So please break through the confirmation bias. And that, frankly, remains at the bottom principle, the foundation of building up to a stage where we can start being able to decipher between the disinformation and actual information. Absolutely well, sir. Thank you, JK. And thank you, Gen Z. I think you both summarized our conversation up really well. It's not just for the newsrooms. It's not just for media professionals, but it also comes down to whether it's your grandmother, your grandfather, your aunt or your uncle that's sending you messages. Don't blindly hit forward. I think it's so important. Uh, the responsibility lies with you. Even if you are the receiver of misinformation, it can end with you if you just spend a few more moments just to check and verify the facts that are stated in that message and so with that i just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out this afternoon to talk to us and talk to our online audiences i'm going to toss it back to winnows for the rest of the afternoon but thanks jk and gen z have a good afternoon everybody thank you deepthi thank, thank you thank you gen z thank you just yet and thanks deepthi thanks for doing this this was a wonderful session we got to learn a lot of vocabulary as well info to me cheap fakes Good discussions, actually. It was a thorough, thoroughly enjoyable discussion, and I think you both of you uh, added a lot of significant value to the audience and uh, to the Dijoy team for having put this thing together. Thank you both very much. Thank so uh, with that, uh, yeah, thanks. So we'll be moving on to the uh, next session. Uh, the next session is uh, on um, what about credibility. I have uh, my colleague and co-convener, uh, uh, Prem Shankar, uh, who will be moderating this uh, event. And uh, we'll be beginning shortly in another uh, 10 minutes with the next uh, panel discussion in the same link. Uh, please uh, uh, wait for another 10 minutes and we'll be starting out with the next panel. Thanks, guys.
Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome again to the second panel discussion of the day three of Digital Media Conclave 2021. And uh, a quick intro. I this particular session is going to talk about credibility, and uh, I would like to introduce my co-convener and honorary secretary of Dijoy, Prem Shankar, to start kickstart this particular discussion. Hi, Prem. Over to you. Hi, Vinod. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, opening the panel today. Uh, we have a very good panel today uh, to discuss this, uh, a very simple three word topic. In fact, you know, uh, we uh, just to give you a brief as to how we came about this digital uh, conclave and how we designed the three days. The idea was to target three specific audiences. One was policymakers, the other was media owners, and finally, media professionals, and not to leave alone the learners, especially a, a good deal of student population who are showing interest in participating something like this. So with these three uh, audiences, we had come about with three verticals with which we wanted to uh, sort of deal, uh, approach this conclave. And we split it into three days. The first day was about the technical aspects of uh, of digital media. The second day was uh, the first day was about the revenues and costs and all these all the issues in terms of uh, uh, you know building a good digital platform uh, uh, in terms of revenues and costs and all those details which include the finances. The second thing was about second day was about the the technical details. You know how tech ready are we uh, are we in terms of digital media? And final day we had reserved for basically the journalistic aspects of digital media. And when we were talking about, you know, uh, when we were to come around as far as the, uh, the journalistic aspects of digital media was concerned, we just finished a panel, a very interesting panel with uh, Gen C and Jaskarath moderated by Deepthi Kumar, our Honorary Secretary, where we were talking about the technical advancements and where we are today in terms of dealing with, uh, with digital media, uh, approaching it from the side of journalism. And we heard all those interesting aspects that they were dis discussing, artificial intelligence, how deep fakes, which Gen C was referring to as cheap fakes, really very, very interesting insights. And finally, we thought, you know, there is, how do we bring in this aspect of credibility, the aspect of telling truth, the aspect of being honest in this, uh, in, in, this uh, in this whole digital media space when we are in the business of news uh, dissemination. And, and we could only think about a very simple three word title, which is what about credibility? And we could think of some 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 of the best names we could think of. We we wanted we approached them. They were kind enough to uh, participate in this uh, in this panel discussion. As of now, we have with us uh, Govind Govind Raj Govind Rajetra as the founder of Boom, and uh, we will soon be joined by Faith Souza, an independent journalist who's uh, a very uh, popular uh, news personality. Govind, welcome. Uh, we are also we also have uh, Vinod. If you are there, if you can uh, sort of help play out with this video that we have got uh, from Srinath Srinivasan, an international uh, you know, journalism uh, professional, uh, an academician. He's been with the Columbia School of Journalism. He sent in a message with some of the aspects that I'll be discussing with uh, Govind and Faye very soon. It's a short video, Govind. If you can, if you don't mind, we'll, we'd like to quickly play this out and then get into. The discussion with both you and Faye. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing that, uh, Govin. Uh, Vinod, can you just play out what uh, the message that you? Hi, everyone. I'm Sri Srinivasan. Greetings from New York City. I'm at Sri on Twitter, S R E E, and I spell my name Srinivasan the other way than my dear friend Prime Point Srinivasan. Congrats to him and to Prem Shankar and to everyone who's put together this very important, timely conversation at Digital Media Enclave 2021. I wish I was in Chennai with all of you, but I am here in New York City. I bring greetings from Rupa Onikrishnan, my wife, who's from Chennai, which makes me a son-in-law of Chennai. I've been asked today to talk about digital media credibility and to answer three questions. So looking forward to doing that with you right now. 
First question, have you seen instances where the rigors of journalism are compromised in the need for compulsions like breaking news first on digital platforms? And what are the dangers of these going unchecked and what needs to be done? This is such an important question. In these last 21 years that I've been working with Srinivasan and everything that he does, we have seen the evolution of the speed with which things break online and the reasons behind people in media forcing attention to the breaking news as quickly as possible. The reason for that is the competition is now at a fever pitch much more than ever before and there's so much confusion online and so people want to be first even if they're not accurate and we need to all take extra steps to check the accuracy of something before we send it out. We have all learned that when you post something online or go on the air with it or put it on social media, it immediately goes around the world. And if you try to correct it, if you try to say, well, this, these facts are wrong, here's an update, it is almost impossible to be able to correct that. The correction will not go as far as the original post did. So what does that mean for all of us? We need to be paying attention and teaching our colleagues that we may want to be first, but it's much more important to be accurate. We have seen so many media organizations lose their credibility because they chase the idea of being first before they chase the idea of being accurate. So if we can all make that effort, we will be able to be better at this. The problem is that we are reacting to so much noise on the internet and the growth of Twitter and other platforms have just accelerated that process and accelerated the amount of pressure that is being put on media organizations. What we need is uh, a way for people who are looking at news to understand that journalists are making the extra effort to fact check and get something right instead of just putting it online first. Let's go to question number two. Are metrics becoming more important than conventional journalistic tools like verification, telling all sides of the story, and prioritizing credibility? That's so interesting because we have certainly seen the growth of analytics and metrics and numbers that tell you how many people have read your story. In the old days, if I had a story in the newspaper, I just presumed everybody read my story, but we know that that's not how it works, right? Just because somebody gets a newspaper, they might be flipping through it, but they're not necessarily reading everything. Now, we have tools that can give you second by second where people have spent time online. And that information, that data is wonderful because we get so much good material about what's working, what's not. The problem is that so many media organizations are being driven by that data and are not focusing on making sure that we're not just chasing the lowest common denominator, we're not just chasing cheap traffic just to get some eyeballs on something, whereas we have real, important, credible stories that need attention. A good example of that I like to talk about is what happened in Darfur. We know that in that region of Africa there was terrible starvation, uh, of course, as a result of international politics. And the New York Times journalist Nick Kristof spent a lot of time talking and writing and spending time there and putting stories in the American media, mainly in the New York Times and through its syndicate. There was nobody really getting up in the morning saying, I wonder what's in Darfur, until Nick went out there and started doing that reporting. And so if we were basing everything on analytics, we would never send somebody to Darfur and do the, those stories necessarily, but we have to find that balance. And I think it's important for journalists to spend time understanding metrics, understanding the numbers, because the business side of the house is going to be doing that. So own your numbers, understand your numbers, so that then you can be one of the people who uh, is able to spin your own numbers when the time comes. So if someone says, gee, there's just too many uh, people who are not reading your stories, you say, well, look, I have fewer readers, 
but I have the right kind of readers. And so journalists need to take ownership of that. There was a comment here about telling all sides of the story. I think that is important to have other sides of a story when, when it makes sense, but to give everything equal footing is one of the reasons we're in trouble here. If we think about things like uh, climate change, the greatest cr catastrophe of our time that's yet to come, or you look at uh, the way America has handled the pandemic, in both those cases, there's this understanding that we have to give both sides equal weight. Well, we you know in climate, uh, in the climate crisis, it's been something like 90, <coughs> 90 I'm sorry, our dog Tara is saying hello to all of you. Uh, we've seen that something like 97% of scientists know that man-made activity is causing climate change. But those 3% who, are get, who don't believe that and mostly funded by the fossil fuel companies, those folks are given time on the air. And I don't think that should be the case. Or when people are handling the pandemic so badly in America, a systemic failure of government, media, and individuals, the reason for that is also that giving equal side or equal time to different sides. So we must get away from that uh, as even as we try to understand numbers, metrics, analytics. Those are all things that when I was growing up in journalism, we didn't care about. We had like one big circulation number or TRP number, and that's all that mattered. Question three. How have the best and worst newsrooms fared when it comes to dealing with clickbait in its conventional and contemporary forms? This is another term, clickbait, that when I was growing up didn't exist. Uh, there might have been sensational headlines, sure, but the word clickbait didn't make sense then. But now, of course, it does. And as I think back again to my time with Prime Point, Srinivasan, and all the things that we have talked about over the years, we have seen the the practice of sensationalism, which drove a lot of media all over the world, India and America included, how that has transferred and been uh, kind of set on fire by the world of online journalism. And we want to uh, put an emphasis on accuracy, as we talked about already, but also kind of humanity. You know. Um, using other people's suffering to get people to click on your videos and photos is just cruel and uh, is not helping at a time when there's deep polarization around the world on so many topics, at a time when we're all struggling to make sure that we have the best possible accurate information uh, using clickbaity headlines does not help anybody. And I tell folks all the time that one of the reasons why we're in this situation with the pandemic, why it's being extended, why we're seeing uh, so many variants and everything is because the journalists have done a poor job in communicating the accurate information and uh, chasing uh, clickbait has contributed to that problem. So I hope this helps frame some of the issues that you're thinking about. And I would love to hear from you and to be in touch with all of you. My email is sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E dot -E net. And again, I'm on Twitter at sri. I look forward to seeing all of you in person in Chennai in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody, and talk soon. Goodbye. Well, that was uh, Srinath Srinivasan, uh, who could not join us. He, he wanted to be a part of this uh, panel discussion, but he could not join us. But we are still joined by uh, Govindraj Etiraj, founder of Boom, and also independent journalist uh, Faye D'Souza, who will be joining us very shortly. I thought I'd quickly uh, introduce uh, Govind here. Uh, I mean, for all of you who are listening, it just uh, as I uh, give you a brief on Govind, uh,
Hi, I'm. I'm. I think uh, Prem had uh, dropped technical this and technical issue aside. Uh, just give me a minute, Govind. I'll just uh, get Prem back as well. Sorry, Govind. I think uh, Prem is joining in a in a minute. He's just joining the same link. Just give me a minute. I'm actually sorry for the technical glitch. I will go ahead with Govindra Dethra's uh, introduction. I think I dropped off right from the start. I'm very sorry about uh, the technical glitch. Uh, uh, for, for those of you who are listening, uh, I was just saying that listen to number of times you hear the word uh, founded when I'm going about introducing Govindra, Govindra Jethraj because uh, he has founded so many interesting and very useful organizations. And as I go through his bio, welcome, Faye. I'm just going to introduce Govind and then uh, introduce you, Faye. Uh, so, so here it is. Govind is a media executive and uh, entrepreneur with over 25 years of professional experience whose public interest journalism ventures are safeguarding the transparency, accuracy, and integrity of news specifically and digital content in general. Most recently, he founded Boom, an independent journalism initiative that fights misinformation and explains issues with, with the larger objective of making the internet a safer place. He also founded India Spend, an award-winning public interest journalism platform. He also founded Fact Checker, which monitors media, politicians, and other prominent figures for accuracy. Previously, he was a founder, editor-in-chief of Bloomberg TV, a 24-hour business news service launched in 2008. Prior to setting up Bloomberg TV, he worked with Business Standard Newspaper as the editor, New Media. And before that, Govind spent five years with business news television, CNBC TV 18, where he drove most of the channel's programming, growth, and expansion. Prior to television, he worked in, uh, in, in the print media with the Economic Times and leading, uh, and leading business magazines. Govind has won several awards in recognition of his professional ser uh, service to... Uh, to name his most recent one, Govind was named a 2018 McNulty Prize Laureate in recognition of his leadership with Boom, India Spent, and Fact Checker. Now, that's uh, that's Govind for you. Thank you so much, Govind, for joining us. And let me also quickly introduce Faye D'Souza, who's just joined us. Thank you, Faye, for uh, uh, making it to this panel. Faye is undoubtedly one of the most prominent news personalities in India currently. There's more... There's so much uh, her audience knows about her already that uh, then what I can uh, even introduce. So here's a short summation of 
Her career so far, which probably is something that many of you may not be familiar about, Faye began her career in 2004 with CNBC TV18 as a features producer in Mumbai working on, on personal finance. Over the years, Faye grew to cover corporate, uh, corporate crime, policy infrastructure, policy, infrastructure, real estate across Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi, and Mumbai. She went on to become an anchor and editor of personal finance at ET Now and worked uh, in the channel for over a decade. Faye eventually launched Times Group's Mirror Now and became the face of fearless, fearless journalism talking truth to power. Faye is now an independent journalist and entrepreneur running her own news and discussion shows and doing special shows on international news platforms. She's a recipient of several awards and her biggest recognition award and accomplishment is the following from millions of viewers who are keen to hear her views on current affairs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faye and Goen, both of you such uh, flourishing tributes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so, uh, you know, Faye, just before you joined, I was telling uh, uh, Govin that, you know, this, this, this conclave took about three days of planning. We were, uh, we were talking about revenues, financial aspects of digital media on, the, on day one. We're talking about the tech aspect on day two. And we came to the uh, day three when we were deciding on topics. We wanted to focus on the journalistic aspects of, uh, of digital media. And just before this panel, we concluded a panel uh, talking about how artificial intelligence, how uh, you know deep fakes and all these things were influencing uh, the, the journalistic endeavors of uh, digital media platforms. Uh, Gen C, Jacob and Jaskarit were participating in that panel. A fantastic one where they sit, they, they see a lot of pushback from the digital media for good and uh, bad means. So finally, we came, we arrived at this topic, which was interesting when we said, you know, how do we, how do we integrate this aspect of credibility, the, the aspect of truth, the aspect of, uh, you know, which is, which pr probably is the basic thing. And, you know, some of us were even thinking, what is there to talk about it? It just has to be there. But that, it wasn't that simple, right? It, there's so many factors right now. And I'd like to begin with that basic, that basic raw question as to where is credibility right now? I, uh, I'd, I'd like to go with you, Govind. I mean, where do you where do you think we stand right now? And Faye, the same question to you after Govind finishes. I think we can't hear you, Govind. Sorry, uh, sorry about that. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prem, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here on this, and of course to be uh, uh, to join my old colleague and friend Faye. Uh, on this platform. Uh, I don't see much of her nowadays, but uh, this is obviously a happy occasion. Uh, you know, <clears throat> this is a very, very tough question. I mean, you know, when you say, what about credibility? Uh, somewhere, I mean, we all start what we do or we do what we do, assuming that we're all credible in what we're doing. And yet the reason you pose this question is because somewhere uh, there is concern that uh, what gets transmitted or gets received is not seen as credible enough. So I, I, I thought maybe if I can flip the question the other way and say, OK, what is not credibility? Uh, so let me maybe take a stab at that. So one is, I think, uh, opinion is not credibility uh, necessarily. I mean, the person who is saying it may be credible. and But what you say, which uh, uh, which is the opinion or do you write, uh, may not be the most credible because obviously it reflects a certain view or it may reflect a certain, uh, let's say, narration of uh, uh, of facts uh, which uh, may or may not be true to its true to where uh, the the original uh, statement came from or the original fact came from uh, you know in india spend uh, we deal with issues around health education environment and gender and one of our uh, biggest endeavors always is to keep opinion out, out of what we do and thus strive for credibility the second thing i think is uh, uh, popularity is not credibility i, I think a lot of people uh, confuse the two and uh, uh, and and uh, assume that uh, there, because uh, there is popularity in any brand, uh, organizational, uh, institutional, individual, that uh, there is also automatic credibility. But actually, that doesn't. I, I mean, it doesn't flow necessarily uh, that way. I think the most important thing, and which is why we should all ask ourselves this question, and I'm going to stop after that, is: Are we credible to everyone? And you know, so let's say I, uh, a bunch of us say something, and uh, we've uh, she talked about polarization, right? So there is one bucket of people who will outright believe what we say and buy into everything that we dish out. But there's another set of people, and that's a large set uh, uh, at any point of time, is not going to believe anything you say. On the matter, on the, on the contrary, it's going to disbelieve it just because you said it. So then, where is the question of credibility? So. 
if credibility does not permeate uh, across, uh, I, I don't mean it has to permeate 100% across all constituencies, uh, but if it does not permeate to some degree across everyone, then perhaps the question to ask oneself is, uh, am I really credible? And uh, is what I'm doing uh, really credible? And that's a question that I think uh, we all need to ask ourselves, else uh, we will continue to live and flourish in our little echo chambers. Uh, the, 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 the only corollary to that is, I think, uh, credibility takes time to build, uh, you know, and it's uh, sometimes it's uh, it also uh, holds you in good stead when you make mistakes or deliberately or otherwise. If you look at the biggest brands, uh, me, news media brands in this country, uh, arguably many of them are uh, not the most credible uh, today. But and yet, uh, because they've been around for so many decades, because their brands are so all pervasive, uh, the credibility that they hold with uh, both sides uh, of the aisle is much higher than maybe a lot of other people who we may think are, let's say, uh, are uh, objective or credible or popular and, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, credibility takes a long time to build. Credibility must, uh, if, if you really mean, if you really believe in credibility or mean, uh, or, uh, mean that credibility should, uh, uh, you know, connect and touch, then it should uh, really uh, uh, connect across, uh, across uh, aisles. Uh, across sets of people or constituencies, and uh, and and finally, it is it is uh, a very very long journey. I, and I, I've been uh, we've just kind of done about ten years of India spend. Uh, are we a credible organization? I don't know. Uh, I think we've made some headway, but I still think sometimes when I uh, see some responses, and, and I'm not talking about trolls and things like that, but uh, that we have a long journey to make when uh, in terms of building a truly credible, believable uh, product. Thank you. Faye, uh, same question to you. I mean, what does this whole credibility aspect really mean to you? And and go and yeah. it, laid it out really well for us. Over to you now, Faye. So, um, first of all, good afternoon. I just uh, I, I want to apologize for being late. Um, I think one of the no. problems with uh, connecting remotely is also the dependency on technology and the internet to work when we want it to work. And a lot of times we find ourselves on the wrong end of that, uh, you know, that stick. Um, also, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with the both of you. Um, Govind was editor at CNBC when I started off as a cub. So it's always an honor to be on the same panel as him. And Prem and I were former colleagues as well. So this is nice. Um, I think, I mean, I completely agree with everything that uh, Govind said about credibility. I think it's unfortunate and I find it sometimes heartbreaking that um, in India, we've forgotten what credibility should sound like. I mean, the average Indian has forgotten what credible journalism needs to sound like, right? Um, we get, like, let me give you an example of some of the criticism um, that we hear regularly about journalists, about, uh, you know, ab about certain publications. They'll say, you don't praise the government for doing good work. Or you needlessly focus on uh, things that are going wrong. Or uh, why is it that you're always questioning the government? To me, at least where I started from, uh, the colleges that I went to, the editors that I learned from in the beginning, these three things actually qualify journalism for what it is, which is constantly questioning establishment, um, being tough in terms of um, you know how we, how you look at every single aspect. Like you, you could have a community of 100 people, 99 people could be very happy. There could be one person who's suffering from a lack of human rights. That one person is the story. It's not, I mean, uh, no democracy functions based on how happy the majority is, right? So I feel like over a period of time, we have forgotten as a community, as a, uh, the receivers of journalism, what journalism is supposed to sound like. And now we've reached a point where we've also forgotten that journalism has to necessarily fit into the non-fiction category. We are now, uh, initially I was worried when I saw some things happening on television that they were in the fiction category. Now they are in the fantasy fiction category. Some of the stuff that we see play out on some channels are really, really worrying. Um, and with every passing year that this goes on, I think the audience tends to more and more forget what um, you know the actual what what credibility is supposed to sound like. Um, one of the things that we are taught in journalism school and in our newsrooms is that journalists are humans. Newsrooms are run by human beings. And you will, of course, uh, have human error. There will be mistakes that will be made. Someone will write something wrong, someone will make a mistake. There will be genuine mistakes that are made. Uh, true credibility is when you acknowledge and apologize for that mistake 
and correct it in your audience's mind, saying, hey, we printed this. It's not true. We want to tell you that it's not true. Or we said this on the channel. It's not true. We want to tell you that it's not true because it was a genuine error. The problem of the lack of credibility comes when there is a, um, a deliberate stretching of facts or exaggeration of, of um, you know, what, what, is the, what, what's, what the story is at that time, a deliberate misrepresentation. And um, I want to be able to, I think that the constant attempt as journalists is to come in every day and try as hard as possible not to, you know, to, to set aside your personal emotions, to just set aside the biases that you grew up with, because we all grew up with biases, and aim as far as possible not to let it deliberately affect your work and to reduce human error. I don't think we can ever, you know, completely negate human error, but to reduce human error as much as possible. Um, and credibility, I've always believed, like Owen said, is like a wall that you build brick by brick, day by day. Every day you come in and you do one good job, you put one more brick in that wall. And over a career of 30 years, maybe you will wind up with something of some, you know, um, of some value. It can't be done overnight, but it can be knocked down overnight. Um, you know, the day you decide to wantedly, on purpose, misrepresent a story, stretch the facts, um, put out stuff that your advertiser might like, hold back stuff that your advertiser might not like, you know, that, that's when you knock down that wall. And uh, I can tell you, I have sat in meetings where these things have happened and where managements have made decisions saying that, uh, you know, we have a contract of advertisements with this one particular state government that will run out after two months. Do this story after that contract has run out. You know, so when you start making decisions like that from management downwards, then obviously then credibility takes a massive hit. So there are so many, I mean, this is such a difficult thing to tackle because credibility is on the individual level for every journalist. It's on the organizational level. It's on the media business owner level and it's on the government and society level. So um, the longer it is allowed to corrode, the more difficult it's going to be to find our way back. So well put, uh, Faye. That brings us to the next question, actually, both uh, uh, Faye, you and uh, Govan, both of you emphasize on the point of over the years, like uh, like Govan said, and brick by brick, as you said, Faye, uh, is there time for that in today's mad rush that we see? You know, I you want to start uh, a digital media platform, a news platform, you want to straight away be number one, you want to, in terms of metrics, where is the time and, and who is dedicating that? Uh, that energy, that effort to actually tell your journalists and the news organizations to say, you know what, we want to build a credible news platform while we do want to make it uh, worthwhile in terms of content. So how how do, how is the tackle? I mean, how do you see that playing out in, in today's day and age? Faye first. Uh, I think the advantage of digital then is that the costs are lower. And so when the costs are lower, you don't have, you're not... Um, you're not laden with demands from investors. The demands on you, the pressures on you are much lower. And so you can choose not to run the race. I mean, I personally think that internet analytics, so whether you look at your YouTube analytics or your views and your clicks and whatever it is, it's just TRPs in another form. Right? And TRPs and readership is what got us into this mess to begin with. So I think that personally, and I can only speak for myself because there are so many people on the internet right now, I think personally, the internet allows us the luxury of not needing to be number one and needing to cater to a smaller group of people who value the work that you're doing. Uh, just making enough money to be able to pay salaries. Yes, I mean, you're all, this also means you're not going to be uh, massive business owners and be valued in crores and crores of rupees uh, anytime soon. But that's a choice that you're making. And I think that internet specifically allows that. I mean, you can choose to chase the uh, Google AdWords and you know be on top, be the most clicked and stuff like that. But then that will require some sacrifices, both in investment and in credibility. That's the way I see it. Um, I mean, I think keeping the team small allows you the ability to sort of control also what you're putting out. Logan, how do you look at it? I mean, you've run bigger organizations. I mean, Faye is trying to keep it small and say, OK, there's still some sort of optimism there. You're, you're running big. You, you have run big organizations. How do you see it play out? 
No, no, we are not much bigger, uh, Prem. And I, I, I completely endorse what Faye says. And I think the way Faye puts it is also a useful reminder to everyone as to why we got into this in the first place. Uh, I think the day you waver from that and you start setting other metrics, I want to be more popular than that website or I want to have more traffic than this website, then in some ways you've already lost the race and perhaps not uh, true to the reason you either started this or you even got into journalism in the first place. So, I mean, we, this is a discussion about journalism and its impact and credibility, which is linked to it. If, if, uh, if, if that is your objective, then much of this has some play, but definitely not, uh, it's, it's not the determining or the driving uh, force and it should not be. And uh, I think the day uh, some of us lose sight of that, and and you and it is it is a temptation. I'm, I mean, not for a moment am I saying that uh, you know we are not tempted, and we say oh we must be more popular, uh, we must reach more people, and so on. Because uh, some people might say that uh, I mean, if I am going to support you in some way, then you obviously need to have a certain degree of reach. It's a tough battle, uh, but it's also to me in some ways uh, something that you wake up every morning and you've got to ask yourself why am I doing what I'm doing, or why are we all doing what we're doing? I think. So some people will always work with you because it's a job and uh, they, they're sort of, you know, uh, marking out their own career. But there are some people who uh, join you and work with you for exactly the same reasons uh, you are, uh, which is, uh, like I said, to do, do good, good journalism, to have social impact, uh, to bring about change uh, in a way that's meaningful, to restore some balance in society. And I think that's really what hopefully will always remain the metrics for us and should, and like I said, but it's also a, a daily uh, question that one should pose to oneself. You know, Prem, um, yeah. I wanted to tell you that when I left television, obviously there's this big question, right? Because I came out of the Times Group and you, you start to ask yourself, were people taking my calls because of the brand that I was representing or because of the person that I am, or the journalist that I am? And the first person I met when I exited the building was Govind. Um, and he very graciously agreed to give us, to give me and my team space on his, on Boom, to give us the studio, said, hey, come do a show with us. And that was actually, that made a huge difference for me because it felt like, hey, you know, there is some value we can still bring. There are people who still believe in, you know, in this and this, because you come out, if you, if you exist in a system for long enough, you start to believe that that's the world. And you forget that there is, you know, there is life outside of that world and there is integrity and credibility outside that world. So when, I mean, when you work in a system that has people like Gobind in it that say, hey, you know what, come, let's work together, let's do good work together. I think that ecosystem is also really important. And there are lots of pockets across the country of people who are doing good work. And, you know, the appeal to the audience is always to find those people and support them. Very interesting. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, while we're talking about uh, what Govind and you said in terms of time taken to build credibility, the, uh, there is also this factor of time taken to do each story. You you get an information, you want to put it out immediately. Uh, you know, traditional mm -hmm. conventional journalists have been built uh, with this basic bread and butter that you call everybody, verify this information, put it out. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, effort basically. That's many of many of uh, these streams don't take uh, that effort right now, and uh, and each story goes out the way uh, they want it to be put out. Is that a big casualty of this? Uh, you know, I, I I'm smiling because you said uh, calling and verifying information takes time and effort. That's like you know being a carpenter and says and saying carpentry takes effort. <laughs> Obviously, that's the job. It does take effort, but you're right. Um, in television, I found that this whole business of trying to be first just puts such an unhealthy level of pressure on the team that um, reporters start pushing information without really checking it. Desks start picking up information, flashing it. You have kids on the desk. Yeah, now they're like barely out of college, pick stuff up. It goes straight on air. Before anybody's had the chance to actually make a phone call, this thing is on air already. And in the era of WhatsApp, it's a horror of horrors that reporters actually pick up information from WhatsApp and then flash it to the channels that they're working for. Um, so there is a breakdown of that system completely because there is this pressure to be first before others. I've also, I mean, again, realized that in the era of social media, and this is, again, for me, a personal choice. I'm not speaking for anybody else. In the era of social media, the audience finds out what is happening whether or not you tell them. 
either Twitter will give them the information or someone will forward it to you on WhatsApp. There are so many different platforms in which somebody will tell you something has happened. I think that the, uh, the space that we would like to occupy is in putting that into perspective, giving a historical background to what has happened, maybe bringing in a voice that will help the audience understand it better, stuff like that. Because there is, I don't see a benefit, especially if you're a journalist who functions on the internet, I don't see a benefit in telling it, telling you this information before anybody else, or even telling it to you along with everybody else. I see a benefit in being able to break it down and give you a background, give you context, give you history, uh, help you understand what has happened a little better. Uh, that is where I see the space. And I think that that's a space that the audience is also craving at this point, because what we have is a flash a headline flash, which is like one sentence. And then you have people yelling at each other for the rest of the day. Nobody's actually sitting down telling you what happened. Uh, so, you know, just breaking down information and fact checking is, I think, where the audience really needs, uh, you know, the, the, the help right now. And that's the space that, you know, we'd like to occupy to break the first half of that sentence. And, and Govan, uh, talking about fact checking, I mean, that's, that's sort of your domain right now. So, uh, how do you see that playing out? So, you know, fact checking is a new thing. And I mean, in the way we are, we are talking about it today, uh, actually, if you look at the, the genesis, it's actually in, in many ways, it uh, began uh, in uh, 2016, November, uh, with the election of Donald Trump as president. And uh, in retrospect, it became clear what, that there was a new phenomenon called fake news. Uh, and it also became an institutional phenomenon because there were institutional players who got into the game, not just in America, of course, where we could see it very vividly, but also in other parts of the world, including in India, where uh, uh, misinformation or the use of misinformation to achieve a certain objective became a tool and uh, and resources uh, or lots of resources were were put into it and are continuing to be uh, put into it. So uh, we are, I think, in a in a different in a in a new world. There, uh, it's it's difficult to say whether uh, it's it's going to continue in the same form because, like I said, there are institutional resources driving this phenomenon. Uh, and it was uh, perhaps again going back to 2016 or even attempted in 20, uh, 2020 in uh, in the United States. It was uh, perhaps uh, extre extremely clear. How technology uh, in in the beginning, earlier with Cambridge Analytica and later with many other platforms, uh, state actors like uh, Russia, China, all coming together to you know to disrupt the internet social ecosystem and obviously uh, man uh, uh, to own the message and then manipulate it. So. So there is a lot that's happening, which is not just me telling you that, you know, uh, why don't you take this medicine and you'll feel better at the end of the day or, uh, you know, do steam inhalation that might be a cure for COVID. So that's I mean, that's the pretty, uh, you know, same stuff if in, in a manner of speaking. So I think as we look ahead, I think a lot depends. One is uh, on technology itself. I mean, can artificial intelligence uh, and uh, machine learning or more sophisticated algorithms control this problem. Second, I think, is is more human nature. Uh, and there's a supply problem and there's a demand. Uh, there's a supply side and there's a demand side. The supply side is not going to go away very easily because, like, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. But on the demand side, uh, can we train ourselves to sift between uh, misinformation and information, uh, true, uh, truth, and, uh, truth, and not so. I mean, not non-truth. Uh, can we particularly as younger people uh, be more uh, aware of what the internet is all about? I mean, the internet is everything. It it has uh, the the source, uh, uh, let's say, the source material in, in a John Hopkins University website. It also has Wikipedia, which is constantly being manipulated. And it has other things which may be true, but you are not in a position to judge uh, because you're just not uh, knowledgeable or educated uh, in, in the specialist sense to understand. So I think... Uh, we have a journey to go. I, I would I've always felt that uh, misinformation would start taper, tapering off after a certain peak, uh, but it seems to be holding at a much higher level and continues to go upwards whenever there is something coming up. So right now in India, we have many provincial or local elections coming up and we are clearly already seeing the rise of misinformation around political issues. Uh, equally, uh, uh, we for different div driven by different constituencies, we saw a major uh, a major spike a series of spikes uh, thanks to COVID and then vaccination, more so in other parts of the world than perhaps in India, but definitely in India as well. So it's difficult to say what uh, how this will go, but it's going to be a big challenge because the thing is, you know, mainstream media will say that, OK, I will uh, go and find out about something. If it is not true, I'm not going to report it. So uh, uh, matter over. 
the the way it works from on the on the demand side is that people are going to come to continue to consume it and remember that over all of this you have a situation where trust in mainstream media or media in general is low and perhaps even dropping lower if if you see many of the whatsapp messages they'll always end with that one line which says that uh, you will never see this in mainstream media yeah. do not believe what uh, xxx newspaper tells you you know so i think those are some of the larger questions uh, and and going back to your primary question on credibility and and that is where i think we have a huge challenge coming up and we have to think very carefully about it there are no easy answers is, is it is it going to be damaging if uh, you know coming back to the question of credibility is it going to be even if is good is are things going to get even worse when you see let's say a uh, 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 an app platform which says uh, um, which is probably be- probably becoming a very popular news app which says that you know you will get information in 60 words or you you will get uh, maximum information within 1 hour if you subscribe to our app and you see some of these uh, either these news organizations i don't know if you can call them news organization but they they are uh, you know they are widely advertising they seem to reach out to a huge population you see them advertising during ipl matches because i don't know how many news organizations can actually do that but they but they do and like somebody was in the previous like jency was talking in the previous panel about how they started looking at news as content uh, that's it it's it's just content i need to get this content i need to put this content out so how much content do i create so is that going to make things worse or is it just another way of evolution of how news is going and if that is the case what's going to happen to credibility in that case again go in uh fey you want to go first yeah <laughs> so see i like i said right um i think that with the internet there is constant innovation in format in length in how long people are going to write stories and tell you whether you could you know there is i think that it, it, there's advantages on both sides right the internet has unlimited space and so you can do as long form as you want we now have podcasts that run into a couple of hours at a time which television or newspapers could never afford neither could radio at the same time the internet also has you know 60 words 140 characters 240 characters that sort of thing i don't think the format per se is the enemy at all it's the intent and um, you know like govind said how close you hold the um, the reasons for your existence how how closely you hold those values to your heart when you're writing those 60 words if if you're writing them with the right intention you're making sure that the story is not being misrepresented you're not uh, the, the team is not under pressure to put it out before everybody else so you're bringing down human error at the end of the day i think that these are the rules that we followed when uh, there were only a certain number of newspapers a certain number of magazines a certain number of television channels um which is coming back to what i had said which is uh, how important is it for you to make sure that no personal bias comes into your work when you're putting it out and human error is minimized as far as possible whether you're writing 60 words or you're writing like 4000 words i think the it's it the, the thing stays the same prem i think uh, two things i think one is uh, you know disruption is part of life and uh, we have no choice but to accept it uh, you know i was on some panel uh, or i think i was on a preceding panel uh, where uh, the ceo of times internet was there and i think one of the representatives of these platforms were also there and it was a little uh, i mean obviously there were some sparks flying all around and for precisely the reason that you just mentioned and i can understand right i mean i'm investing all this money in uh, sourcing uh, news uh, army of uh, reporters correspondents all over the country and all that and here is someone who just picks up those you know few lines and then creates something and builds an entire multi billion dollar uh, valuation model on top of that it's tough to it's tough to stomach but i i think it's i don't think we have an option because that's that's the march of technology what do you do the but the on the other hand i think we have to remember that news consumption is a limited uh, game uh, you know every day in the only about maybe 5 out of 100 people get up and say i want to know what's happening in the world around me or as we put it i want to understand the context of what's happening in the world around me 95% of people are happy with entertainment you know so if you look at numbers uh, trp numbers for instance you uh, in tv channels you'll see that for all the noise that we uh, ourselves get consumed by of news tv actually news tv is very small when you compare to the overall uh, 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 you know television uh, broadcast mix 
and that's true anywhere and that's the way it is i mean you look around in your own family does everyone want to read the newspaper or whichever version digital or physical answer will be no do they really want to know what's happening no unless it's something very specific to do with their lives uh, for which they will always be happy to get it when they want so i think so we have to accept that once we accept that i think then is a question of okay what is the role that we are playing within this uh, are we going for highly specialized roles and and those i think become uh, automatic already i mean we uh, like if i say i uh, we started india spend and uh, india spend focus uses data to tell stories in public interest in areas like health uh, and education so let's say we did a, a long series on tuberculosis uh, a couple of years ago now uh, how many people really want to even get up in the morning and read about tuberculosis and uh, how we are failing as a country uh, on either on identifying it or tracking it down or having the right kind of treatment doses for it so most people don't uh, but if a few people who are relevant read it then perhaps our our job is done and 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 so on and so forth i mean you can keep extending that analogy and i think there are always there will always be some people who want a little more value added in their lives and they will find it uh, whether they will find it from fay or they will find it from an, a, a, a digital uh, news organization or uh, or maybe some member of the family so so we have to accept that and uh, only if you accept that will you really you know uh, move forward and uh, we also have to accept equally like i said the march of technology which is relentless i mean tomorrow there may be something that will come and put uh, all these 60 word guys out of business uh, it may put us out of business as well <laughs> you you never know uh, you know so we have to think about how we would reinvent and so on but i think as long as we are focused on the cause uh, and there are other people who believe in that cause that uh, the truth needs to be told and in a manner that uh, you know may or may not be uh, digestible sometimes i think there will be always an audience for that thanks govind we had uh, just at the beginning of this uh, today's uh, conclave we had uh, kollam uh, cpm mp uh, shri nk premachandran uh, join us he had given us a very uh, quick brief in his keynote address and he uh, one of the points he emphasized that uh, was that there needs to be some sort of regulation there can't be i know it's a very very often spoken about subject but i really want go in and fay to uh, tell me what do you think about it uh, uh, the panelists before us uh, jency very clearly said he's he's completely against the idea but then the mp was trying to sort of explain why he thinks that there needs to be some sort of regulation there can't be a complete free hand so uh, your opinions please go in and fay is is there time if if you know it matches well with the whole credibility idea also because at some point if people don't value this whole idea of credibility which is being built over the years brick by brick as you said uh, is there some need that somebody comes in you know either uh, an ombudsman's kind of thing either the press council of india or somebody comes in and says boss you 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 strain too too away ahead from this or like what the mp was selling some regulation that needs to come in what are your views on this govin <laughs> Uh, uh, Pray, ma'am, can I throw that question back to you? When you say credibility, <laughs> and when you say regulation, what do you mean? I mean, you say reg regulate us okay. as. So let me give you an example. I mean, let's yeah. say our organization is a company. It's a private limited company. It's fully regulated. I pay taxes. Uh, okay. uh, you know, we file all our statutory. Uh, you know. Uh, Uh, uh forms we do everything on time and uh, we are constantly i mean if, if we would be under scrutiny if we uh, messed up somewhere uh, if you are, if you're asking me in terms of the content that i put content. out or the information yeah. i put out on the website what could be the regulation that comes to mind uh, i mean that would be a start point okay so uh, to, to bring it down to a very very micro level uh, you know even probably uh, to what people uh, individual start uh, doing youtube streaming you know i know that you don't uh, i'll give you a very uh, recent example that i saw a very disturbing example i'm sorry to say it out so casually it was a sexual abuse victim whose uh, image was put out by an by a youtuber claiming to be a news uh, uh, youtube mm -hmm. platform he just he just put, puts out the picture he just puts out the name things that you should never do on a on a media platform but he does it uh, and he gets away with it he's uh, he is a popular uh, youtuber and uh, this is content this is disturbing content this is no no straight straight away but it's done so in in situations like this uh, uh, but this is a very micro level example and it's a very extremely disturbing and bad example there are macro level examples where people stray away from this whole idea of uh, uh, credibility in a very uh, in a very different sense from 0 to 10 somewhere in between do you want somebody to step in and say uh, boss you can't do this this is not done or do you say there is complete freedom go ahead and do whatever you want people will figure out that this is not supposed to be done 
So that's I think that's where the MP also came in from and saying, bring in regulations. Right. So if you're saying that this was posted on a platform, uh, the platform uh, must and has the ability to uh, remove that piece of content because it's offending. And all platforms today, uh, maybe they did not start out like that, but today definitely have the processes and sufficient public pressure to ensure that those processes are followed, uh, particularly when it crosses the line. I think the, the question where it becomes a little uh, uh, maybe more blurred is uh, freedom of speech. Uh, do I have the freedom of speech to express what I want to about, let's say, the government of the day uh, or an individual in the government of the day without getting abusive and, and so on? Uh, I think that's where uh, uh, where they would be concerned if regulation starts to step in or we start to define things. But when it, I mean, I think the kind of example you gave, I think the line is clearly crossed there. And I think there are many people who are responsible and there is a law that could also, uh, yes. if someone were to file a complaint, were to step in. Uh, Okay. Yeah, Govan's right. There is a law under our sexual assault laws, which are very strict, even more strict when it comes to children who are victims that, uh, you know, the, keeping the identity of uh, the victim and their family members and everything secret. There's a very strict law under the IPC uh, that can be brought into. So there is already regulation. I think what we're missing uh, Prem, in many of the cases that we will call out is that there are laws that already exist, laws that can be enforced using the IPC that can be argued out and then um, in a sense that can be proven in court, uh, you know, in your in that system already exists. We also have a system of self-regulation, uh, whether it is print or television and digital media, uh, most digital media now has self-regulation as well. The gray area is now creeping in spaces where the self-regulation maybe is not working because there are some members who aren't you know, who aren't towing the line of the self-regulatory bodies. Then in that case, it comes to what needs to be done if your NDSA or your uh, your press council sends you a notice and you don't listen. Then what happens? I think that's where there might be a question arising. But personally, for me, um, I think that you know, we, journalism has to be self-regulated. If we hand over uh, regulation of media to a government, any government, you will no longer have a free press and by extension no longer have a fully functioning democracy all right yeah i think uh, thank you so much faye and go and this, this was fantastic you know to be very honest when we were thinking on this topic they said is there anything to even talk about that's where we we began this topic with even while deciding on the topic and there's so much there's so much more to discuss i guess uh, we could uh, go on but very valuable points faye and uh, Govin. thanks a lot for joining us uh, we will be sharing the recording for a larger audience who can take valuable points that you mentioned from this panel discussion. Thanks again. Thanks a lot for joining. We'll be moving on to a thank you, workshop. Pei. That's yeah. Thank thanks, you. Thank, thank you. Pei. Thanks. Thank you. Pei. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. We'll be moving on to uh, uh, a workshop that will soon uh, begin on regulations and what it means. Uh, it'll be. It's a uh, uh, one of the foremost uh, cyber experts cyber law experts uh, now vijay shankar is going to be uh, holding this workshop we'll quickly see you on the other side of this uh, with the workshop that navi will be uh, conducting thank you so much for joining us